perspective across Central and Eastern Europe. And it's really a great pleasure to be second time guest of this really marvelous webinars. So hopefully I'll be able to answer or give you some insights from the practical implementation of the directive throughout CE today. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as promised, we'll first go through the updates. Uh, the update is like last time, there are no updates. It's just that we are moving closer and closer or nearer and nearer perhaps i should say towards actual transposition in estonia and poland um, what is encouraging of course that we see uh, ever more experience with setting up reporting systems in the other member states so hopefully the late adapters will be able to uh, really um, benefit from the experience already gathered in the other countries and then we'll move to the first question of the four that we selected uh, for this webinar. And the first one is a bit theoretic uh, legal question, uh, which in general only should come to play once a case is legalized. If a whistleblown case needs to be brought to court or there needs to be a legal assessment made of the uh, legal position of the various parties involved, what determines the applicable forum, the jurisdiction or jurisdictions uh, of a whistleblowing case? Uh, Julian, could you please take us through this topic? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, most of the laws which are transposing the directive uh, in the Central and Eastern European countries um, do not give a direct answer, but indirectly respond to this question, saying that the jurisdiction for resolving a whistleblowing case is determined by the jurisdiction of residency of the employer uh, who, who need to handle the report. The tricky part in it is uh, that very often uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, you have employers who are in fact subsidiaries of big multinational companies and because of the peculiarities of the way that the directive has been transposed, namely that in many of the countries, anonymous reporting was not implemented. The directive is still providing an opportunity for the employees to use the internal whistleblowing channels, not of their direct employer, but of the group that they belong to. And we have already seen a number of cases where employees of companies registered in Central and Eastern Europe have decided to go, because of the restriction on, on submitting uh, anonymous reports, they have submitted such reports using the internal whistleblowing channel of the parent company or even of the grandparent company, aiming to uh, receive the, um, the support and the protection provided to whistleblowers under the domestic legislation of these companies. That's, that's the main driver. Do, do you think that this um, this might influence in a certain way how a case is looked at from by the judiciary by the judiciary for example by the by the courts or by an authority uh, that is dealing with whistleblowing reports i mean do you give up your right uh, for protection in one member state if you report uh, through the channel of another another entity in a different jurisdiction well, that, that's a very good question. And uh, we have only one court case, particularly in Bulgaria, where we have seen the court elaborating on the applicability of the whistleblowing legislation, but that was mainly related to the material scope of the whistleblowing report, because we had a case for uh, termination of the employment contract where the uh, former employee claimed that that was a result of a whistleblowing report he submitted. Interestingly, the court said this is this was not the case, um, and I wouldn't get into that much details right now, but uh, to the extent that it is very clearly provided that the violations which the report should refer to must be violation of the EU legislation as specified in the directive, or specific violations of the domestic legislation to the extent that this is explicitly stated in the law for transposing the directive. I think on, on that perspective, we should not expect uh, a lot of um, questions. However, 
to, to answering directly to your question, I think that the the spirit of the directive is really to protect the whistleblowing process overall. And therefore, I don't believe that um, this would be considered as a kind of an uh, overriding. It's really a, a, a legal form of protecting and it is also a kind of a real interpretation of the meaning of um, freedom of speech on one hand and open speak up culture that this directive is all about. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think that uh, it's also important that companies don't overly look at this topic, as you say, from a legal perspective, but from the perspective of the desire, the value of the information to be received. So don't be just led by uh, your legal um, allowance or restrictions. Also, please look at it from the value of the reports that you might receive. Next question. Are there any national requirements regarding intake methods? Um, I think the background of this question is that, for example, in uh, some member states, the uh, intake methods to be offered to potential reporters are very well defined and very broad. For example, in Sweden, you must offer a means of oral reporting next to another obligation of written reporting. Other member states do not mention such uh, obligations and they say, well, you, you basically you're free to choose which intake method uh, you offer. Could you tell us your view on this and how companies are dealing, especially if, if they operate multinationally, Julian? Well, that, that's also a really challenging question uh, in light of the um, the situation for most of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, as I said, we have pretty large group of subsidiaries of multinationals. Starting with what the domestic laws provide in most of the countries, this is really a free alternative to choose the respective method. Uh, basically, all of them are available, whether submitting in writing or orally or in person, being interviewed by the um, whistleblowing officer of the company. Uh, that's really a free choice. The interesting story is uh, that quite a big number of, of the countries in our region do not allow anonymous reporting, which basically means um, form over substance dilemma is in favor of the form, unfortunately. In some of the countries, we even have a um, further step where the regulators have provided a specific form to be submitted in terms of the content of the report and not being compliant with it may end up in refusing the report to be processed. Therefore, uh, that, that's a tricky uh, question. And in light of, of your uh, second question, Jan, uh, we have already seen a case with a multinational company, interestingly headquartered in Central and Eastern Europe, but with operations in other member states in Western Europe, when they were selecting the tool to apply for the internal whistleblowing channel, their head of legal was struggling that the tool was providing an option for the uh, whistleblower to choose whether he or she wants to be anonymous or disclose its personality. The decision that was made that to the extent that a number of states in Central and Eastern Europe just for example, Bulgaria, Romania, Czech Republic, they do require um, individualizing who is submitting the report, and that's a must. Um, that ended up in the decision not to buy the respective tool because the head of legal considered this is misleading the potential reporter. And if he or she chooses anonymous report, they may, they may lose the protection which the law provides them only if they disclose their uh, personality. So from that perspective, although the countries in Central and Eastern Europe do provide freedom of choosing the method, because of the specific form requirements that is causing further problems. Yeah, yeah, this, this is indeed a great, uh, great challenge. I think it's a pity that this is the outcome of the transposition in a couple of member states. Um, and in practice, I, I've also heard of companies that say, well, actually, 
even though you might not be protected uh, on a national level by the uh, by the applicable law we still want to process and respect your report uh, even though it's anonymous so we we've, we've seen various uh, various responses to that yeah if, if you do allow me on just one addition here because you're raising a very good topic here um quite a lot of the multinationals decided to be very democratic and I, I can confirm that even with at PwC, um, the tool we are using does allow anonymous reporting. And the decision being made by the partners of PwC was that even though in some of the countries in our region, this is not legally possible, they would not stop the processing of the report. However, they have inserted very clearly and very well defined in the respective entities internal rules on whistleblowing that this may stop the protection, but they undertake to process and review the report, eventually undertake even an investigation if that's required. Yeah, I think that's really good addition. And for all the people listening in, uh, so this is one of a couple of people who has that practical experience. So if you have any questions, uh, how to set this up in practice, uh, do contact either us and we'll put you in touch with uh, Julian and PwC or please contact them directly. Next question, how to maintain independence of the people managing the whistleblowing reports? Where is that question coming from? from the directive, which says that the people uh, in charge of managing, of processing the whistleblowing report should be, uh, that that should be done in an independent fashion. What is true independence? That's a difficult question to which we, I think, cannot provide an answer. Uh, but in practice, what are your views on this requirement, uh, Julian? How, how, how should organizations tackle this? Okay. Um... If you do allow me, I will give another life example with PwC. <laughs> Perfect, um, yeah. And um, the fact is that for many years, PwC was using an internal hotline for reporting ethical violations. When the directive came into force, um, the partners dealing with this topic decided that um, this should remain in place, but obviously all the uh, PwC entities in the network needs to be compliant with the regulation, uh, sorry, with the, with the directive and the internal legislation. And because in the past, very often the hotline was managed by partners who were leading practices, obviously that may very often put them into a conflict uh, of interest situation uh, and not being completely independent. Uh, if a report comes out against the same very partner or any of his fellow partners. So the decision being made was that we have a team of uh, whistleblowing officers. As a minimum, that's three per country, uh, guaranteeing to a large extent uh, that an independent one will handle the report. Now, it's a it's very um, reasonable question how you define who should do it. Uh, there are some internal regulations in this regard. Obviously, outsourcing the function and the process is definitely another good alternative that we believe is also applicable in this case, especially if you hire a professional organization dealing with such type of business. Yeah, and, and we, we see that indeed um, in, under the GDPR, you have the data processing uh, data protection officer, sorry, and it would be very nice to see that kind of function, that kind of role growing, developing across organizations. Indeed, pure uh, independence is, in my opinion, not possible unless you outsource to an NGO, for example, uh, but I haven't heard of any NGO who is not eventually financed uh, by the organization who asked them to do this work. It would be very nice if uh, governments set up these kind of entities, which they don't because what they do set up are the authorities um, to overlook the protection of whistleblowers. Uh, they assess how the case has been managed or not previously, but they don't manage the cases themselves. Um, maybe connected to this question, uh, we could already uh, answer one of the questions that came in early during this webinar uh, is, is, is 15 minutes ago early. Um, 
when should a whistleblowing case or a whistleblowing report, sh when should that be considered to be closed inside the whistleblowing system? Is it after the uh, whistleblowing representative have, has provided feedback or even before such feedback? Uh, Julian, could you please provide some uh, guidance, uh, some advice, uh, and this is of course not legal advice, but some recommendations uh, on how to do that. How, how long should cases be considered open? Um, our position on that is because very often support clients who are dealing with whistleblowing reports uh, internally. And, and very often what the clients decide to do is uh, if they decide to go for investigation that the investigation needs to be completed. There should be a report of what is what the findings are, what conclusions could be made, and then a management a managerial decision is taken by the company itself. Um, normally, in order to make sure that there is quite of a transparency, we always uh, guide them and instruct them to keep communication with the whistleblowers. Uh, if that's handled internally, uh, respectively, if it's handled by an independent entity, same approach. And with all the practical cases that I have been personally involved in, this has always been the case. So we, we don't close the case before the investigation is completed, if an investigation needs to be run. In case where there are some problems with the report itself, either with the material or the personal scope, or the topic not being subject to regulation um, of the domestic law, respectively the EU directive, that needs to be communicated uh, clearly and transparently to the whistleblowers so that they understand why there is a, a decision not to go further with it. But, but obviously, there should be clear list of actions completed and communicated to the whistleblower. Yeah, and, and how does that connect to the, the let's say, the audit uh, trail? Is, is that something, I think, also from a GDPR perspective, any uh, any step in the processing of personal data m you must be accountable for? Um, how does that connect to the, to the logging of all the actions regarding a reporting uh, a case of whistleblowing? Well, I think we, we discussed this during my previous participation in, in the, the webinar. The, the very interesting part on uh, merging compliance with the whistleblowing legislation and uh, data protection, GDPR, because normally in, in a more complicated case, you're really gathering quite a lot of data, very often including a lot of personal data in it and therefore uh, in conformity with the requirements of GDPR, this data needs to be kept for some time. Even if you close the case, you need to make sure that this data is kept uh, in case of a reopening the case or in case of an audit by the regulators. Um, and that should be a period which is provided ex lege. Now, depending on the scope of the case and, and the topic covered, that may be a short period of time, three to five years, in some cases, if, if it, the domestic legislation does require a longer period, uh, a typical example I can give from Bulgaria is um, any payroll-related fraud, um, the, the, the period uh, for which you need to keep the data is up to 50 years. So it's, I, I know it's a very tricky question, should you keep the data for 50 years, but in reality, that's what the domestic law requires. And I think th this is exactly one of the parts where software can help um, because it just allows you to, for example, before archiving a case to anonymize it or to pseudomize it and in that way, or to store it in a different environment, which is closed from the access to other uh, um, environments where you manage the regular recent cases. So that's, that's one thing I wanted to call out. Another thing regarding software, before we go to the fourth question, which I already put up on the screen, I see in the Q&A a lot of questions quite specific. Uh, where is anonymous reporting prohibited? Uh, which jurisdictions ask for something or uh, impose an obligation to do something else? Please 
get in touch with us with Navex, we have a specific tool for that that helps you to keep track of all the transpositions across the European Union, the transpositions of the EU Whistleblower Protection Directive. Um, we call it Compliance Manager, very easy to remember. And the Compliance Manager is an overview of all the transpositions across the EU. So um, we can help you to always be live up to date on those updates on the transpositions. And with that, we move to the fourth and um, last question that we prepared for this webinar. And that the question is, when should cases be escalated to the authorities? What is the trigger moment? And maybe the most important thing to call out is that ideally, companies should want to keep matters internal. Also from a reputational perspective, it's just a very tough uh, situation. If the information is out there, you have authorities that start to sniff around. If I can say it, I, I mean it respectfully, they just be, become involved. It's just more difficult to control a matter when it's external. Um, Julian, please enlighten us regarding this topic. It's a big challenge for companies. Yes, it is, uh, and especially um, there are certain areas in, in the material scope of the directive which clearly refer to incriminated actions. Um, therefore, um, you have the dilemma, okay, how much and how long I can keep this internally, and when do I need to go to the uh, authorities, the law enforcement on particular authorities, and, and do a report something that is clearly an incriminated act um, and constitutes, um, I mean, criminal offence. Normally, and, and this is what we've seen in the past, uh, supporting clients and doing internal investigation in response to a whistleblowing report, the client always would prefer keeping it as long as possible internally. On one hand, making sure and using uh, independent professional um, support really to understand what is behind the report, whether that's fully uh, supportive, can you, def can you find evidence to prove the statement in the report um, of the whistleblower, uh, what is the impact of the uh, wrongdoing or the misconduct performed by any employees or other parties. And whenever it's been, I mean, undoubtedly evidenced that this is really a kind of a crime or an action which is incriminated under domestic law, you simply have no, no reason to keep it internally, but you need to contact the law enforcement authorities, either being the prosecutor's office uh, or the police in the respective jurisdiction. Um, the, the other alternative, and, and that really depends how good uh, professionals the whistleblowing officers are, if from day one, you don't want to play with this topic at all. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, although this is a very, very specific area, but um, I, I've been professionally involved in it, uh, sport integrity is becoming a very hot topic these days, uh, particularly match fixing, uh, bribery uh, and related uh, misconduct by players, coaches, uh, referees. And in, in most of the cases, the respective national sport federation do have their own integrity agencies which are independent bodies, in most of the cases using either former Europol or Interpol officers, or in some cases even uh, CIA, uh, FBR uh, former officers, who are really professionals and very easily can identify the case, resolve it and, and conclude whether that's incriminated act or not. In such instances, very often the, um, the employers or the uh, organizations that are running the internal whistleblowing channels do prefer to refer the matter as soon as possible to the authorities. Uh, and, and there are two reasons for that. Number one is that requires a lot of professionalism, which is not available or rarely available. And number two, from reputational perspective, this is really important because if they don't do it properly from the beginning and it turned out to be really a, a, a crime, um, then the reputational damage is severe on this organization. Yeah, thank you. I will move this slide to um, this one. This is the poll 
we would love to hear from you uh, which type, what type of information you would uh, like to receive from us or be contacted in certain um, on certain topics. Um, don't forget we have that solution which helps you to keep track of the whistleblowing uh, transpositions, the whistleblowing law transpositions across the EU. So maybe that's uh, something interesting if you would like us to provide you with a demo of how that works, how that feels, please let us know. Um, we still have about one and a half minutes for a last question. I found this one in the Q&A. May a member of the central compliance department, a very often headquarter level, um, of a multinational when may that person and to what extent may that person have access to the reports received by subsidiaries? Um, I think that it's interesting to know that such right actually exists, but it will be a balancing act between protection of the confidentiality of the whistleblower and the right uh, of the headquarter to know what types of cases are reported within the organization. So this will very quickly be a matter of uh, uh, pseudomizing a report or just reporting on the main aspects of it without going into much detail. Julian, do you agree with this? Anything to add in the last minute? Yeah, I, I fully agree with your statement, Jan. I, I would be rather in favor of uh, just giving statistical data to the head office without disclosing any personal data. Yeah, perfect. The other questions, because we've got many, many, many more, we'll try to address uh, during a next webinar. Um, this session has been recorded and is available on demand uh, in the coming days as well. The slide deck is available. And again, for any questions you might have or recommendations uh, that you have, maybe an interest in the services that PwC can offer you, please do get in touch with us. This was today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, very much looking forward to seeing you next time. Uh, and a big thank you to you, Julian, as always, great insights. Thank you so much and have a nice rest of your day.